We're live. If you're there, we're only testing for the next two minutes. So checking the sound level, etc. Can you see if it's come up on the computer? I wouldn't know what that would look like for her. Just that last screen you had is there. Ha 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 ha. Yes. It's come up. Got it. Yeah. But everything's in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. But the questions aren't, surely. No, just my notifications. All right. Okay, here we go. <laughs> there we go. That's what I wanted. Oh. Okay, we'll just check. People can see and are coming along. Oh, yeah, we got... Okay, brilliant. We've got people here already. Okay. All right. We're still about a minute early. A minute to go. We got the microphone sorted out this time. So, <laughs> <laughs> sort of, sort of. Were you going for an old wire based one, not the radio one? No, we couldn't get the wireless ones to work, so we're doing a wired one. Let us know if um, okay, it sounds good, brilliant. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but one of the problems last time with not having the microphone was um, our assistant behind the phone had a dog. And everyone could hear it breathing. Panting. Yeah. Did you see that? <laughs> no. <laughs> we got a few I comments. I heard it. I heard it then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's what that was. If anyone was confused, I think someone thought it was drawing. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't. It was a Pomeranian breathing. <laughs> but unfortunately, she isn't here today. Um, so you just have to listen to us. I'm going to take down questions, by the way, that are coming through. We've got a load from the last time, which was brilliant. And as usual, we can't get through all of them in one go. So I've copied the ones that we didn't get to last time. And if people have new... <laughs> Travis enjoyed listening to the dog. That's good. <laughs> if you've got new questions, I'm going to be making notes this time as well with those. All right. Well, for why? I don't know if you saw this, but when you go on a trip, the last part of it seems much faster because you're taking in less and acclimatizing less so the last bit of the trip always seems to go much faster than the first bit is that a common perception mm. ah well more trips so you get used to it yeah actually i just thought that wouldn't apply to you but <laughs> <laughs> it does make sense for me and how i feel well i'm always a little bit out of sync so with myself wherever I am okay thank you um, I'm going to leave you in charge of the questions okay so I'm going to start with a couple of the ones from last week um, which we didn't get to at the time and the first one is from Jonathan Phillips and he asked will the exhibit get a page in your next book um, and I think that will refer to the last two exhibitions that we did jointly the secret yeah. path yeah for sure absolutely and the issue is really whether Freya would mind her pictures being in my book and she she said no so we'll definitely have it yeah the more things out there the better as yeah. far as I'm concerned <laughs> Um, Gallen asks any chance of two volumes for this next book so you don't have to cull too many paintings out for anyone who didn't see last week we were talking about your fourth book that yes. you're working on the plan frankly is well there's always thousands of drawings so the drawings often come in small or are edited out but I'm hoping we won't add, edit out any paintings and as a consequence, the book may well be double the size of the early books. So the plan is to increase the size of the book rather than make two volumes. That may change, but that is the current plan. Um, the next question, if you talked about this in the last live that we did, yeah. I wasn't concentrating because I can't remember. Okay. 
Um, but Kristen asked, um, are you featured in the new Tetris movie? Did we talk about the new Tetris movie? We did. We did, actually. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. New Tetris movie is coming out on the 31st of um, March. It covers the period of Hank negotiating the deal with the Russian state and with Alexei. And my involvement with them didn't occur till after the period covered by the movie. So I'm not involved. And my involvement was in two parts. The first part was Alexei said to Hank, no, Hank said to Alexei, we're making, you know, gigantic mountains of money. How can we help you? And Alexei basically said, well, don't talk about it here or I'll be arrested. And they went to the park to talk about it. And Alexei said, I'd like a green card and I'd like you to help my friends in setting up a new company. And they set up a company called Animatech. And Hank asked me, basically, what we thought Animatech could do. And a lot of people came up with ideas and I came up with ideas. And in the end, Hank had the idea that we would create a world and adventures within it. And the first project was to be called, excuse me, uh, Secret of the Black Onyx. And in the process of developing that project, I went to Moscow a couple of times, once in the winter and once in the summer, and met up with the guys in Tokyo, in California. And it was a, it was a great project and sadly never happened. But that was basically because the Animatech people were funded out of the, the profits of Tetris, the early profits of Tetris. Do you think anything might happen with it in the future? The art was great and is not just mine, I should say, but the art which was produced by the likes of Michael Kaluta absolutely will stand the test of time. And Mike Emden. Mike that? Emden, yes, and the music... A lot of great stuff was created for the project. Um, the technology will have moved on, but that's just the technology. Everything that was recreated, I think, will stand the test of time. So it's there and it's a possibility, but I know of no current plans. We did do a conversation with Alexei, who invented Tetris, and Hank, who published it. We sat in the prototype of the house when they came to England last and we talked about the movie. So there is an interview with Hank and Alexei and me talking about Tetris, which we will publish around the date that the film comes out. Um, there will probably be lots of other interviews with those guys, but we, will, we have got one and we'll publish it. And I think Trading Boundaries want to do a Tetris evening and they are in negotiations with Apple. I don't know how that's going to come about, but we are looking at a date in late March, um, 23rd, 24th, 25th, possibly, and to do a live painting and a talk all at the same time. So look out for that. We're posted on our website, their website, your website, everywhere we can. I might be misremembering this. Was Did you say it was Hank who coined the term track and field? For gaming, for that particular game, yes, for the for the um, secret of the black onyx, and what he meant was that when a, a thing is on a track, events happen, but you can't wander all over the place, and then the field areas were restricted because it would have been too boring to get lost and never find your way back into the story. So yes, he he called it track and field, and we worked on those two parameters when we were working on it. And if people want to see the artwork, because I really, I mean, the illustrations for it are really, really beautiful. Which book is that in? Is that in? It's in Magnetic Storm. Magnetic a lot Storm. of it is in Magnetic Storm. It's very, I thought, Jodorowsky's Dune. <laughs> when you watch that film and you see all of those artists coming together, drawing mm. things out, those pictures of like... Who Mick Jagger dressed up in costumes that Moebius had drawn or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if you want to see those. Mm. 
<laughs> uh, Roger, have you ever been asked to appear or have been on the Graham Norton show to promote your work? <laughs> there's, there's any number, there's millions of shows I haven't been asked to appear on. I, I don't really think I'm a celebrity and I think that show is for celebrities. My work will be well known, but I'm not. What have you been on though? Many, many more in the 70s. Yeah, anything? Anything I can remember? Anything I would know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't think of anything I can remember at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, so Washington Espinola says, I'm going to see Rick Wakeman tomorrow at Palladium. Will you be there? Sadly not. And the tickets are sold out. So Michael couldn't get tickets. It was... And Adam, Adam Wakeman was getting Michael tickets and he had his ration of guest tickets withdrawn. So, yeah, it was <laughs> tight, tight. <laughs> Didn't plan well enough. I did talk to Rick yesterday and hopefully we'll do something together in the coming months. Can you say anything more about that or not yet? No, not really, no. It'll be, it'll be a talk. It won't be anything more. Okay. James Ball says, um, love the fox ring. Is that a squirrel on the left? No, it's a badger. And this is the fox. Um, the shop that actually dad and mum get me these. And the shop that sells them has sort of stopped doing animals, haven't they? Cut it back. They haven't stopped, but they've... It used to be mostly about it, and now it's very few of them. So I'm mentioning this just in case anyone knows of any good jewellery <laughs> <laughs> shops that do animals and things. Um, I don't design them. Someone else asked that. I did buy silver clay. I don't know if anyone's tried that and did a couple of my own, but I'm not quite this level yet. <laughs> Uh, so Chris Nelson asks, Roger, what do you think of a virtual world made completely out of your painted environments? Well, <laughs> which one is that? I'm looking it's at the Chris. Here. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what do I think? Um, that is something I would very much like to do. And it's very frustrating when other people with almost unlimited resources do it without me being involved and without <laughs> even asking my permission. So, yeah, I would love to do it. Absolutely would love to do it. I see you have a question there from Cindy. It wasn't really a question. So um, in the exhibition, The Secret Path, that we did, we worked with a lot of really amazing people and we wanted to talk about them a little bit more this time. And I put in Cindy Poon's comments as a sort of prompt to yes. saying thank you to everyone. Well, she says Todd did an amazing job with the installation. Todd did an unbelievable job of, first of all, blacking out the gallery, then painting it dark blue. Um, but the, I think it's also important to say, and I completely forgotten about this the last time, tied in with the title, it was really important for us that the show have a pathway kind of feel, yes. where you can't see everything when you go in, and it's kind of dark and moody, mm. and the paintings tell the story. Yes, it was meant to be choreographed. And um, we did mention last week that um, Renee got into that and did her own bit of choreography, which worked very well. But there were other people there who were fantastic. They were really lovely. Um, I particularly remember, um, well, PK and another Brian who had a dog called Archer. And Archer was very shy, but he was a very big dog. <laughs> But he was great. In the end, he got to know us and he allowed us into our show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to just go over the names. This is our catalogue from the show, of which we only ever had two. So <laughs> if I can get more off the, um, uh, off the guys at Hate Street, then I'd be very pleased. Kelly Harris was in charge of the team and she was lovely. And looked after us all very well. Um, you were going to mention people too, weren't you? Do we have Renee? 
How do you pronounce Renee's name? De Cossio. Cossio, yes. Todd Shipley, who we've just mentioned. He didn't just... He did an, He and his team did an immaculate job of painting the walls. And I don't think it would be any shame on me to say he put more effort per square inch in painting the <laughs> the gallery dark blue than I put into my paintings. I, my paintings are quick and loose. His were careful, meticulous and really well done. He also hung the pictures beautifully too. You know, they were absolutely spot on. They were great. Mm. So he had that team. We worked. And he worked on my big 3D piece. Um, which I find terrifying because if it fell on anyone would kill them and him and his guys got it up really quickly and smoothly without giving me heart attacks which is what normally happens if I have to do it myself yeah everything was so much easier wasn't it than, yeah than ever yeah yes that was not a trivial piece to hang and mm, we had instructions on how to do it, but he just did it. He figured it out and did it how he wanted, and it worked. That was brilliant. We had other teams there. We had our own team with Hattie mm -hmm. and Mitsias, and we had Brian Chambers, the Chamber Project team, which had um, Johnny and Sarah. They were terrific. And John O'Hara. 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 Yes. <laughs> every time you say it different and every time it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you are a hooligan. <laughs> um, is there anyone else we need mention? You had two people help you in Japan, didn't you? With photography and 3D modelling. Yeah, so with 3D modelling and photography, with 3D modelling, it's Takayuki Matsumine who did an incredible job, yeah, 3D modeling my pieces from my drawings and Junpei Hosoda, who took all my pictures. Yeah. Hattie did a brilliant job. We should mention Niall Whitaker, who did the prints for us. Mm. And Hugh, who worked on the social media. Yeah, that, yeah, we had, it was great fun, great scene. Wouldn't have worked anywhere near as well without them. But but particularly grateful for Todd, making sure it was immaculate. Yeah. Yeah. Where are we now? Okay, so the next question is from Norm Judah. I recently bought a print of um, Osibisa album cover and love the colour. Can you comment on the change in palette from that to your more recent work? It's got a lot bluer, hasn't it? Do you think the, that's what he means? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't say that, actually, because that was so early in my work. Mm. Um, that particular cover was was very dramatic for me because it was... Um, the first one I did, which really got an incredible response everywhere, the record shops put it in the window which is what you would hope would happen mm. but to such a degree that it got noticed all over the place and particularly for me it got noticed by Peter Lederber who was the art director of an underground magazine called Oz which was famous in the 60s but he had a poster company called Big O Posters and he started publishing my posters based on that first Osabisa cover. And that was hugely, hugely successful for me. We sold millions of posters very cheaply. They were uh, less than a pound at the beginning. Hmm. So, yeah, 70p or something like that. And although they... Yeah, People may have them from the back in the day, and I do too. I have a few. The paper and the inks wouldn't last long. If you pin them on the wall, they would fade. The paper's not great. It was just, but it was great to do it at so economically and in such big numbers. But as to the palette, um, I wouldn't say my palette is much different 
it's I still do pictures in that range of colours. I don't know if there's a percentage, if there's more grey paintings now, or fewer, more blue, as Freya said. Or well, not. I would say, like, if I ever see a painting or a photograph out of the corner of my eye that has a dark to light blue fade as the background, I think it's one of your paintings <laughs> for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's that predictable, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know what to say to that because the second Osabisa album was exactly that um, palette. It was exactly that mm. with the bright green and the red. So I'm glad you picked that painting, but I would say that my technique has changed dramatically in that it's predominantly painting now. And in those days it was predominantly drawing. But I wouldn't say the palette has changed that dramatically. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put in some questions from the comments um, that are happening right now. Uh, Mike, I'm going to have to sort of pray see your questions. I hope you don't mind because I can't write them down fast enough and I don't know how to do shorthand. So basically, <laughs> Mike Flanagan says he's heard there's a new Asia tour. Are you doing artwork for them? I what? There's a, he heard that there's a new Asia tour. Are you doing any artwork for them? Um, if Asia do a new tour, I absolutely would love to work with them on that and do new artwork. Absolutely. There was a new tour that I was supposed to be working on and going on too. Um, but it got postponed through illness. So not, not amongst the guys in Asia, but the people they were touring with. So th that currently is postponed. Um, I don't know when I'm next going to be working with the band on tour. Probably yes. But if Asia do anything this year, absolutely. Absolutely. I love working with the band. Um, yeah. Here, the second part of his question was, can you talk about the concept of the new Yes album cover? No. You can't even talk about the concept? I don't think so. I'll find out about that, and if I can... Talk to them. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to Steve and Martin and see what they have to say about that. But um, What we can do is... I can't even acknowledge there is a new cover. Oh, oops. <laughs> or even a new album. <laughs> it's not... This isn't for me to talk about at this stage. This is Yes's business. However, they must be s s putting it out there a little bit because I have seen things online from them, but I haven't formally talked to them about talking about it. So I apologise. I'd love to. We will talk about it. But right now, I haven't had the clearance to talk. So something that Dad just said to me is we probably well, definitely won't be able to do another live before I go, but we might be able to do a couple of recorded conversations and things that we put out later. And maybe that's something you could talk about in one of the recorded ones that yeah. we put out. Yeah, so the answer is I can't talk about it now, but I will talk about it and we'll post it as soon as we can. Thanks for the question, though. Mm. Um, so Doug Curran asks, what are your thoughts on Greek and Roman architecture? When the whole world was a wilderness, it didn't seem inappropriate to show the intellectual capacity of humans by making mathematically perfect architecture. Remember, though, what we know of Greek and Roman architecture wasn't for humans. It was for gods. <laughs> and that mathematical perfection had a sterility to it that was okay in the wilderness that was Greece or Italy two, three thousand years ago. It has no place in a world that is so overdeveloped as we have now. But better than modernism, which is so sterile and so oppressive and so damaging to people both in terms spiritually and their mental health, aesthetically, it's culturally devastating. 
modern architecture. It owes a lot though in its simplicity to the Greek and Roman and justified two or three thousand years ago, much less so now. We were watching that documentary the other day though on Petra, yeah, weren't we? Which I thought, I loved seeing that sort of rock face with the columns carved in. I thought that was so beautiful. It was, yeah. Because that, I thought... I, re I really like, what I like about Japanese traditional architecture and the temples is they sort of look part of the landscape. You can see someone's built something, but it's using the trees that are there and it's sort of using rocks that are there and putting rocks that are natural in an intentional spot and then creating a courtyard around it. So it's sort of just like taking what's there and adding a little spin on it, which is what I liked about the Petra Greek, was it Greek and Roman? I mean, it was a bit of everything in Petra, isn't it, in that rock? I think it must have been mostly Greek, but yeah. Mm. But I thought that was a really, that for me is the most exciting combination mm. when they're kind of combined like that. Mm. Egyptians did things like that too. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, so Dave Watkinson asked, what do you recall about the Pete Dello album cover into your ears? God's teeth. And uh, where do you get that phrase from? That what? That phrase. God's teeth. Where does that come from? I haven't a clue. Okay, answer the first question. Okay. Okay, there was a record company that was formed... Don't touch the microphone. Oops, oops, oops. <laughs> Big oops. Um, yeah, there was a record company called Nepenthe. And we know Nepenthe mostly because of it being a fabulous restaurant on the Pacific Coast Highway coming up from Los Angeles to San Francisco. But it had a meaning. It was the drink of the gods. And I think the record company mm. had a quill as the record label. And I designed that. And it was the idea that, you know, the drink of the gods inspired the poet and the music that was on the album and it was an album label specifically for songwriters so the Pete Dello cover was basically an illustration of the lyrics of a song of Pete Dello was that enough of an answer do you think yeah, well, he just asked, what do you recall about it? That much. Okay. <laughs> um, Travis Creason, I hope I'm saying your name right, asked, what are you listening to at the moment? What audiobooks are you listening to while you work? I think that was it. God. Um, well, I went to the States at the end of January for the close party of my show and two days before I left Freya came back from Japan so we had two days together then I went to the States then I came back and Freya is off back to Japan on Sunday and in that time I haven't wished to listen to anything other than well we've watched the detectorists on TV <laughs> And we've talked, basically. We've talked, watched the de detectorist. Freya has gone out with her old friends from school and her mum. And when she was out, I caught up with other stuff. Yeah, there hasn't been time for a long time. But what I do, I do resent um, audiobooks. Because basically, they do something which I find profoundly dishonest. They charge a monthly amount and I set it up not for myself but for my mum who was nearly a hundred when I set it up and she liked listening to stories on tape because she, her eyesight meant she couldn't read easily anymore and she just loved stories on tape and she liked simple stuff like Dick Francis and things like that and I bought them all for her but you know the pile of these things I did think it would be more economic if I did it on audiobooks. And the first thing I found is that it was damn difficult to make audiobooks transferable. If I, 
downloaded them onto my computer. I couldn't put them on a device that she could listen to. And I spoke to audiobooks and it was incredibly expensive machine, clunky old fashioned, that would play audiobooks from one machine to another. And then, to my horror, and I haven't done anything about it, I found that I was paying a monthly amount to audiobooks. And one day, just recently, I thought, wow, I've collected, you know, um, possibly 30 or 40 credits. And no, I only have six. And guess what they do? They cancel. Every time they add a credit, they cancel one. So what right do they have to take back money you've spent, not used? It's just dishonest. It's what company is that? Audiobooks. It's part of Amazon. Audible. Audible, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I've tended not to want to deal with them because of their dishonesty. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you can see behind Dad... There's a lot of these CDs. Yeah, the audio CDs. So I used to get them from the library and I now buy them where I can. I'd rather spend more for a CD than get them from an audio. Audible. Audible, yeah, download. Mm. But one of the other things, do you mind if I slightly segue? Go, slightly <laughs> or gr- hugely segue. Um, we were watching, we watched a couple of John Grisham films, The Client and Runaway Jury, and I haven't ever read any of his books or listened to his audiobooks, but coincidentally a friend of mine recommended them as audiobooks to paint to John Grisham stories, and I didn't know you've got loads of them here. Yeah, yeah. I, I must admit, if I'm reading a book, I can read simple detective stories or very complicated science books, I can read anything. But when I'm painting, I like to be engrossed and I can listen to, well, (laughs) anything from Agatha Christie, who I find weird, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) But I do listen to them right through to, I'm trying to think of any other ones, but I'm looking to see what I've been reading or listening to. Uh, I think maybe we should publish a hit list of books we listen to. Yeah. We'll do that. We we'll put up a list on on the website of music and books and movies maybe. Yeah. I be, I started listening to Terry Pratchett for the first time in my life last year, which was great, but I couldn't help but start seeing landscapes in his books in my paintings. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, there you go. Um next question? Yeah. Um, Doug Curran asked, Roger, has your old friend Richard Branson asked if you want to take a trip in his Virgin Galactic? Would you do it? Would Freya do it? I would. That's Uh, him saying that. (laughs) If he did ask, and I expect he has quite a big list before he gets to us. (laughs) um, I would say, I wouldn't let Freya go, but I would go. (laughs) (laughs) Same for me. (laughs) Okay. Um, so the next question that we have is, how did you come to choose Grass Valley and the Chambers Project? I didn't. And that's from Steph McCormick. Well, first of all, I didn't choose them. Um, I got an email from Brian Chambers, who, who owns and runs the Chambers Project. And he was in England to see Ralph Steadman who just done a joint project with Mars, Mario. And they collected the prints. And while they were in England, they tried to contact me. And they did find finding me quite a challenge. And we ended up meeting at Mike Lawless's offices. Mike is my uh, friend and architectural partner when we get round to building stuff. And we talked. took him up to Trading Boundaries, they came to my studio and we talked about working together and we did and it turned out very good. I like his enthusiasm for art in general, I like his enthusiasm for mine and for <laughs> It's been 
it's been a pleasure working with him and he's based in Grass Valley. So, yeah, can't think of a reason why we would be in Grass Valley anywhere. We could have been in, I don't know, Carmel, Mill Valley. They're all beautiful villages. San Francisco, it could have been anywhere. But it's where he is. So that's where it was. And it worked, you know. People come to his gallery. So, yeah, that worked. It's not going to stay there. It's going to go to somewhere um, <coughs> more densely populated near... Los Angeles next, I think, but that's not yet a done, not yet a done deal. It'll be, it's been currently finalised. Mm. Grass Valley is pretty though. <laughs> I wish I could have gone. I'll have to do it next time. Yeah. Um, Tony Cad asked, "What are you working on at the moment?" And actually, somebody else asked, sorry, I did write this down, I think. What album are you working on now? Are you working on an album? And if not, what are you working on now? OK. Um, that The answer has two parts. There's a painting part. And I'm going to be doing live painting of two things. One is... I've done some extension paintings of existing paintings. What happens if you turn round so that we could f fill in the gaps for the um, for the virtual space that we were doing needed to be made either virtually or in paint and naturally I preferred to paint it. So a section of that is being painted right now and I'm going to finish it live and I'm going to do a very simple painting for a band called The Optimist, who I've just met. And yeah, that sounded fun. And I thought they were local, but they didn't. They travelled <laughs> a few, maybe a hundred miles for the meeting. They said hello, by the way. Did they? Mm. Ah, good. Well, yeah, and I'll do that live as well. So those are the two live things I'll be doing. The other thing, though, is that this is the year... I want to put as much effort as I can into getting us building a visitor centre, which isn't just the architecture, isn't just an exhibition space, but is also a showcase for the best in design in a decorative way as well as a functional way. So much more like arts and crafts than the modern movement. And I know a lot of craftsmen I'd like to have work with us. And I know a lot of artists I'd like to have work with us. So I'm looking to build a place that will be just magical to be in. And it will also be our visitor centre, our gallery, and maybe even our home. Maybe not. But that's that. I want to give that its best shot this year. So that's what I'll be working hard on, plus the paintings. What are uh, you doing? <laughs> Uh, I'm well as soon as I get back renovating the new studio that's in Mitsias's shop I saw you doing the window that looked amazing yeah I've been painting the window we had to wait to book in someone to kind of demolish everything that's built in there already and it's a really strange feeling being without a studio or being between studios it's kind of yeah, a bit of a limbo, but so hopefully as soon as I get back, we can kind of start making. The only thing about my new studio is it's going to be in a window, <laughs> so people, anyone walking past can see what I'm doing, which will be exciting and I think maybe a good pressure to have, but slightly daunting. Yeah, you're not going to be able to put your feet up and stare into space. I just can't, you know, some phases of a painting are a bit rubbish. I just can't have those anymore. <laughs> or you can, you'll just have to I'll toughen put, up. <laughs> put a really good one on the wall so people know what I can do. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to be doing that and just making work for the next show, which, yeah, needs planning. But yeah, yeah. that's about... 
if there are other things. So basically, though, what you're saying is that you're going to be painting this year, this yeah. coming year. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So Freya may be doing more painting than me. If I'm doing more painting than Freya, something's gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, particularly as, um, I don't know, probably no one would remember or know necessarily, but I was in Tokyo based at a place called Courtyard, which was like an arts events venue. And I did exhibitions and group shows and I taught there. And in October I left and it had been maybe six years, I think. And so I, because it was so full on, I kind of wanted some time to just recover from that very full on six years. And yeah, from now on really enjoy just noodling away <laughs> at mm. my own work. Um, having, thank goodness, got to the stage where I can pretty much just do that now. So, yeah, yeah, there is something else we've been, have come up in questions before, but they are a serious, as it were, back, background to what we're doing, is um, we've got, well, four or five stories that need illustrating and may even end up being animated. So well, let's get to that question, shall we? Because uh, that was a, a specific question. Ah, okay. From Bill Sandals. Have you given any thought to doing an animated film based on any album or even a story you have in your head? Well, as I say, we have four, five or six stories and three of them are ready to go. And the steps I was thinking of were we have the story and we have a lot of art but we don't have panels so i thought it might be good to do them first as a graphic novel and then possibly as a movie um we'll be doing developing one of them for the virtual show so that will become storyboarded and the answer is yes they i do, definitely would want to do that do you have any interest in that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've, <laughs> yeah. I've got I've got several I want to do. But also, like, are you thinking of Ping as one of them? Yes. I don't know if we've talked about Ping before. No. Do you want to talk, tell people about her? Uh, mm, not not really at this point, because... But basically, these... Th Three. Two of the stories are stories I told Freya when she was very young, from about two years old through to about eight years old. Mm. And they became, some of them became parts of paintings. Some parts of the story were based on paintings. So there is a beginning, middle and end, but it's only now, well, no, in case of Ping, it's only now being really... Um, put under pressure and discipline to knock it into a good shape. The others have been done already, but Ping is in the process of being done. And so, yeah, this, this is something that over the many, many years um, we've been thinking about, talking about at some point, but not sadly at the very beginning, when I was telling Freya these stories when she was very young, I did start recording them so it, I have the recordings as a basis but sadly about half of them I end up falling asleep every time <laughs> so it's <laughs> they kind of wander off but yeah they're being put together and as I say subject to some storytelling discipline bashed into shape okay just saw a question come up a minute ago. Let me see if I can find it. Um, <laughs> Peter Greenwood wants to know, do you know the best route from trading boundaries to the Griffin? Only kidding. <laughs> Although that is an important drive. Um, it was great. It was a great evening having dinner with you and Michael that night, hoping to see... Yeah, it gets it get back to. Oh my gosh, sorry. 
That's a story, not a question. <laughs> okay, it is not a question, so I will get back to the questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, when are you next at Trading Boundaries? Well, I was there a couple of hours ago. <laughs> I, I thought I was being interviewed by two Czech journalists. One's a writer, one's a photographer. But they literally had four crates of album covers for me to sign. I took f photographs and showed to Freya. It, they had to carry them in in crates in several loads from the car. So if you want to trick Dad into signing a lot of things, tell him you're going to interview him. <laughs> well, it was a fascinating process because I did see stuff I'd never seen. I saw a lot of stuff that was basically a bootleg. But I also saw stuff which was possibly a bootleg and possibly not <laughs> that I'd never see. Of my work, I mean. Um, yeah, it was weird. Weird. I have a friend, uh, Paul Denham, who has the most comprehensive list of covers I've ever done. And I'm going to have to send some of these to Paul because I don't think he's seen them either. Yeah, I, I, I don't know when I'm next there. It won't be before Freya goes back, but it might be soon after. So, early next week. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the next question is from someone whose name <coughs> I'm going to have a go at. Diaxis Goff. Is that your name? That's amazing. Um, what are your thoughts on the way that AR art such as Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion can replicate <coughs> the noticeable style of yours? So do you know how those work? Ah, I've seen examples. This is, the technology is not a publisher. It's a technology. If somebody makes a copy of mine via a technology, whether it's a camera or Photoshop or something super clever, if it's published, it's a copyright infringement. What do I think of it and the ease it is? There have been technologies that have made art seem simple since the last century, or since 1860s, or a long time now. Photography has been described as the end of art, computers have been and AI have been. In the end, the process is very clever. And I can't say it's not disturbing, but it doesn't disturb me too much. It doesn't seem to me to be any more a threat to art than photography was. It's just another art form. Is that the entire question, or is there more? Well, it's just what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I'm very curious. To be honest, um, if I'd known about it 50 years ago, I'd have tried it out a lot more than I would now. What about you? Have you tried it out? Have you thought about it? <laughs> yeah, I think, for me, I would think of it as a really good way of getting ideas for doing some artwork like collaging or photography or sketching. Yeah. I think it would be a really great way of changing the way that you see or imagine things and then working back from that into something physical. Mm. Um, but that's what I would want to do with it. It's also probably the extent of what I would want to own of something from that <laughs> medium. Yeah. If someone used it to create something physically beautiful um, I would find that really interesting. Um, I do want to go at it. I want to see if it changes how I see and think about things. Then absolutely you should. And I, I should for the exact same reasons. Um, hmm. I think it's a good... Um, what Mum said about it too, and I think she's right, is it's a really good story catalyst so we were talking about the Brian Eno questions for sparking creativity that are called, um, oh my God, I looked it up after we talked about it, uh, oblique strategies. 
And I think it's a sort of visual equivalent of those. It's kind of, you put in some words and something comes up and I think it's a really good beginning point for a story because it's something like that didn't exactly come out of your mind, but your mind is going to find a story in there. Mm. Mm. I don't know. It's too new. Watch this space. I, it's too new to, to, for me to have had any experience of it other than to see what others, other people have done. But I'm fascinated and I definitely will try it out. I don't think it's something I can be, that can be ignored and I don't think it's anything an artist should be afraid of. Mm. No, I mean, if it can make art, it can make music. It possibly could write books. <laughs> It means, I guess, that artists and musicians and writers will have to up their game, but, yeah. No, but I think fundamentally humans want to hear human experiences through the lens of another human, don't sure, they? Sure, they do. But who knows how good it will get. At the moment, I think it's interesting, very interesting. And I would definitely be very interested to see what can be done. But I don't think it's a threat and I don't think it's something we should worry about. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Mick Flair says, Roger, I've always wondered what your thoughts are about the very... Uh, um, no, wait, sorry, that was... I was going to ask another one first. <laughs> the questions are flashing by too quickly. <laughs> Does the idea of incorporating older paintings within new ones to develop the narrative appeal to you? I'm only asking because I seem to be making a habit of it, says Jerry Moran. I, 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 I didn't really get the gist of the question. Do I think that's a problem or do I think, do I think do it's do a good it? thing? Do I do it? For sure. Yeah. Does that process appeal to you? Hmm. <clears throat> it appeals to me not as something I only want to do. I've got so many paintings I want to do that have very little in the way of genesis and what I've already done. But, yeah, there's. I always want to know more about a painting. Like I said just now about the ones we're doing for this virtual experience I want to know what goes on next door I want to be able to turn around and see the view from the other side of a painting so I often want to explore paintings and I have done whole sequences of drawings doing just that and developing narrative so yeah Shall I ask the next question? Or you can even answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting sleepy. <laughs> you what? <laughs> I'm getting sleepy. <laughs> you are. <laughs> like it's too warm in here. Ah. Sorry, everyone, if it seems like I've dropped the ball. It's absolutely boiling in here. Um... Oh, we're in trouble because <laughs> I can't read the questions in my <laughs> We'll do a couple more because it's uh, we've got eight minutes to so to round it off to an hour. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so this is an interesting question. Um, I don't know if you'll what your reaction will be. Um, Matthew S. Montgomery asked, "What would you have painted if you weren't painting the wonderful creations you have?" What would you have painted if you weren't painting the paintings you paint? <laughs> I, well, if I, if I wasn't painting the paintings I painted, I'd start doing them now. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I was just thinking. Because I was just thinking, big, sparkly ponies. That's what I'm going to do next. <laughs> I'm doing that next. Ah, <laughs> oh, you want to talk about this? Well, I don't, but it was one of it was a question we got before. It was. Um, if we don't finish the questions now, we'll finish them over the next few days. Yeah. So if you put um, questions in the comments on this, 
when we do the next couple of recordings that won't be live we'll get through them then um, and that will give us a chance to kind of get through a lot more probably because there won't be new ones coming in but one of the last questions was um, has Muka I don't know how you're supposed to say that in Japanese you say Musha but Alphonse Muka is how I would have said it has he been an influence was one of the questions well before I show the Japanese book the answer is um, when people ask me has anyone been in it who are your influences my usual answer is there are a lot of artists whose work I love but very very few of them could really be described as influential the one that I usually mention as being critically in influential was Rick Griffin not so much because of his imagery but because it unlocked the prison of typography for me I I was incredibly bored with the notion of Helvetica as a font it was very limiting and when I saw Rick's I thought my god I can do whatever I like it was fantastically freeing and about the same time I came across Alphonse Mucha both as an artist directly and indirectly by all the other people he'd influenced, like Michael English and... Well, in the book it says Kelly and Mouse. Kelly and Mouse, for sure. Um, They used a lot of the Art Nouveau artist work in in their work, and they did it in a way that was very interesting. But... I did once decide that I will do something in the language of Mooka. And I did it for the cover of Yes Songs. Can you hold that there a second while I check if we can see that? Well, yes, but it's. (laughs) Sorry, everyone, there's a delay. So Dad's going to be holding that for a while. Yeah, that looks good. (laughs) All right. So this, this cover was. Just the painting is inside, of course. It's um, that's the painting, and it had. Gosh, you get a lot of bang for your buck in that album, don't you? Yes, well, there's three (laughs) albums, so it was just my way of making the cover into that language of a book. So I wanted it to look like a turn of the century illustrated book on the outside. Inside, the paintings were full on. There were four, basically. That's the most famous, that one's Pathways. And that was Escape. So that was the story the behind, well, that's a separate thing to go into, the story. But the cover, because I wanted it to look like those turn of the century illustrated children's books, was was me trying to speak the language of Mooka. Now, there is a Japanese book on the influences of Mooka. This was from an exhibition, though, of his work at a very big museum called Bunkamura, which is where Yes play when they come to Tokyo. And I went to see it because... You tell the story. (laughs) Well, I went to see the show. I would have seen it anyway... um, but there's a restaurant that we go to in Tokyo a lot and they told me I have to go and see because one of my dad's pictures is in there. <laughs> um, and I had no idea and dad said he'd had no idea. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, yeah, these are the influences that they kind of show. And this is that cover. But there's a lot, there was a lot of... Those are Michael English. Oh, that, that's the West Coast. Oz. Martin Sharp. Oh, what was that, Michael Kalisha? Is it? On this side. Yeah. Oh, yes, Michael Kalisha. Yes, a lot of my friends were obviously very influenced by Mooka. Um, it's an odd thing to say. It's a shame that the First World War basically switched off the art. Nouveau movement it had a lot of promise. It was, and people like Mooka were fabulous designers 
as well as artists. We've been looking at a lot of the work of um, Frank Brangwyn as mm. well, who is also equally influential, perhaps, in Michael Pierce has just written an article for Mutual Art about how influential Frank Brangwyn was in the West Coast uh, visionary artist movement. Yeah, so by and large, I don't cite many artists as being directly influential. I wouldn't say Mooka was, but in that one particular case, unquestionably, I was trying to learn and speak his language. It's, um, yeah. There are so many really good questions coming up and it's kind of, it's been an hour already, but I think I'd like to end on this one. Okay. Which I will read because I, I guess you can't see. <coughs> Go. Um, but yeah, like I said, if we don't get to them this time, we're going to do a couple more records and get to more of them. Um, but these are so great. It's like having a really interesting conversation with a big bunch of people. Well, it is. <laughs> um, so Peter Greenwood says, seriously this time, Roger, looking back on your career in art and the paths you have taken or could have taken, what advice would you give to young students who might be thinking, I love art, but could it be a career choice? Did you have that discussion with Freya? What advice would you give? What would you say? Well, I remember you telling me that you didn't want to do art anymore because you were fed up with making art out of milk bottle tops. <laughs> I when you was that? that. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say art education has lost its way over the last 60 years, so it would be a hard one, that. But to the extent that Freya asked my advice, which I don't think she ever did, let's put it differently, to the extent she allowed me to give her advice, my advice is to anybody wanting an art career is learn to draw. And life drawing is probably the most disciplined way to learn to draw. Learn to draw, learn life drawing. And the second thing I'd say is whatever else you do, learn a physical craft as well. I did cabinet making, but it, I also did silversmithing. But, I would have loved to have done sculpture. I'd have lo loved to learn lost wax sculpting as much as wood carving. Learn a craft, learn it very thoroughly, and learn to draw. Put in a lot of time on drawing. That's what I would say. And I would say, sadly, you would have to struggle to find an art school capable of teaching you those two basic things. Well, he says, what would you say to art students? So... Presumably these people already have <laughs> committed. Yeah, well, yes. It's, it's a very difficult one because uh, there's thousands of art students wanting to learn to draw, wanting to learn to paint, wanting to learn the physical skills necessary to be creative. And the physical skills are part of the creative process and they're almost never being taught properly. So it's challenging. You will have to seek out good teachers. That's always good advice. Find a good teacher. Well, what would you I, say? I would, I would say don't let the thought you might not make money out of it stop you doing it. Because I've done lots of different jobs and come back to it and moved away from it. But it's sort of been the only thing in my life that's really stabilized me whatever else is going on mm. and I think if I had moved away from it because I thought it wouldn't be lucrative that would have been a huge part of how I feel about myself that would have just kind of metastasized and so what I would say is whatever your education whatever your jobs you have to do however difficult it is making money out of it keep doing it anyway and it takes it takes ages for anyone and it should take time I think because yeah. you've got to winnow out and wait out the people who don't have the time or commitment or skills and just kind of get better and better in your own time in your own pace in you know however you can 
and don't let the fact that you can't write it in your passport as your main career <laughs> put you off or write it there as your main career anyway and fake it till you make it but I think it's such an important fundamental part of life that yeah I sort of don't lump it in too much with work no. Even whether or not I'm doing that as my main job. One of the sad things I have found over five or six decades of talking to other artists and designers is many of them have created stuff of great value commercially as well as culturally and they haven't benefited from it. And that applies to all artists really. But a lot have suffered from the fact that they've done m miraculous stuff and other people have ended up owning it. So if I could give one commercial piece of adv advice, keep your copyrights. Don't accidentally sell them or give them away. If you hang on to your copyright, you may not make money immediately, but you always have the opportunity at some point if you don't own the copyright, whoever owns it will make will have that opportunity. And even worse than them exploiting it is them not exploiting it. One of the most frustrating things is doing great work and not seeing it published. But hang on to the copyright. I can't think of anything more important than that. Mm, yeah, and I think relating that back to my point <laughs> I think if you think of it as part of you that will set you up well in terms of having your assets but also in terms of your soul <laughs> just not signing anything away if you can help it I'm, I'm going to finish because we've passed the time with an anecdote which um, Freya will be very annoyed with me repeating when she was very little about three and a half, her uncle came up to her and was looking at what she was drawing and she said, he said, oh Freya, that's beautiful. Are you going to be an artist when you grow up? And she looked really indignant, hands on hips and said, I already am. <laughs> it's a state of being, not so, a job. <laughs> exactly. However, she came up to me afterwards and sort of whispered to me, Dad, I don't know if I want to be an artist because and I, why? You can be whatever you like. And she said, well, you know some of the most famous artists and they're all broke. <laughs> and I thought, sadly true. We all were broke. <laughs> yes. So is that the, the advice? <laughs> well, you no. You will be broke, <laughs> so get used to it. <laughs> well, it's not true, but it, it has truth in it. <laughs> It's if you want a new remodeled house and 20 acres and stables well <laughs> do something else be, being an artist is very full time and like being a musician is full time the music world is full of people dying to be your manager not quite the same for artists and it's put some time aside and be persistent. Be persistent. There's this phrase from the I Ching, perseverance furthers. And that is true. You need to be persevering. You need to hang in there and practice and practice and practice. Mm. So we've gone over a bit. Yeah. The thing about endless practicing is <clears throat> it shouldn't be a chore. It should be some of the best meditative processes I can think of, actually, to be drawing. And there are a lot of jobs where you can draw at the same time because <laughs> they're quite boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are ways of doing both. When I was working with Hank on the secret of the black onyx. I would go into a board meeting with an empty sketchbook and at the end of the board meeting, I would contribute appropriately and be silent appropriately. But at the end of the day, I would have 
four or five finished drawings. So I complete my task for the week during the course of a board meeting. It, you can do that. And it aids concentration. It doesn't do, it's not distracting. Okay, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And we've got a lot of questions we haven't looked at, so we will. And yeah, bless you all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to switch off now. <laughs>